It's really shocking to me that a portable handheld had a game that looked this good back in 2002. Sure, it's a pixely mess compared to what we've got today, but this was really quite the accomplishment back then. This along with the Doom 2 port looked great because the graphics were either redone or ported straight from pre-existing sprite work from their older entries on the MS-DOS. Unlike Doom 2 on the GBA, however, this is not a port of any previous title. Duke Nukem Advance is a full-fledged original title in the same style as Duke Nukem 3D with a new storyline and directive. Duke Nukem 3D was a vastly more advanced game than Doom 2, so sacrifices are expected when putting the Duke Nukem formula on the portable Game Boy Advance system. I'll tell you now that these sacrifices do exist, but do they hold the game back or are they fair enough as to not impact the score at all? The first thing to do is to pinpoint exactly what these sacrifices are. Upon starting Duke Nukem Advance, you're introduced to a cutscene in the form of artwork and on-screen text. While this in particular only happens twice, the game halts you with dialogue on average around three times per level. There isn't much story development aside from these unless you count the change of location as story progression. You'll visit four different locations in Duke Nukem Advance, starting in Area 51 as an investigation instructed by the orders of General Graves. The research informs you that a new breed of aliens are about to spawn, also informing you of the further development taking place in the ancient pyramids of Egypt. You take a teleporter there, completing your objectives, which eventually lead you to Australia after General Graves instructs you to answer a distress call from an undercover agent of the agency. Duke finds plans that inform him of a doomsday weapon being made in an alien ship. This weapon has the possibility to wipe out the planet, so Duke is sent to destroy the device and then come back to the agency for debriefing. There's pretty much the story in a nutshell, and I understand the game wasn't marketing towards anybody looking for something revolutionary in story design, or even really a good one for that matter. The storyline in the game is nothing more than a reason to go to different locations and shoot some cool looking aliens, and that's all well and fine by me. Now that we've got the plot out of the way, we can move along to the overall design and gameplay of Duke Nukem Advance. I don't need to mention again how impressive this game is on a technical scale, it's a masterpiece in that regard. Textures are smooth in relation to being a Game Boy Advance FPS, and the render distance is truly amazing at times. The lighting effects actually exist to some degree, and the three-dimensional locations look unparalleled to anything else on the handheld. It doesn't just look remarkable for its system, but the visual design overall has a nice charm to it. If you've played games like Serious Sam Advance, you know just how ugly sprites can look in 3D space. Duke Nukem Advance looks comical and comedic the whole way through, just like its counterparts. Technically, the game doesn't differ much in visual design from Duke Nukem 3D, and I don't need to tell you how greatly appreciated that game has been for its charming aesthetics and visuals. Back to the last point, interactivity and audio are present in a similar style of Duke Nukem 3D, but one of these is not like the other. Without sounding too confusing, interactivity is strong in Duke Nukem Advance, sound design not so much. Being able to interact with pop machines, shoot toilets, shoot and kill idle alien pods, these are really neat to see done on a handheld, and how fitting for Duke Nukem to be the one to do this, and to do it well. Something that Duke Nukem games as a whole have tended to do right was environmental interactivity. This game didn't even need it, but sometimes it's the little details that really stand out. Know what else stands out? Yeah, it's time to talk about the game's audio. The lack of music should be apparent to you by now, as you've likely noticed by its absence. For all the technical things the game does right, it misses out on a very key component of, well, pretty much every video game past the Atari 2600 era. The only music you hear in the game is the rather irritating MIDI of the Duke Nukem theme in a format the GBA can understand. Some people have actually admitted to liking this track, but something about it just doesn't do it for me. The enemy sounds are here, but much fewer and far less memorable. There's only a few death sounds, about two idle sounds, and the sounds of their gunfire. Much less iconic. I guess it gets the job done, but it would have been nice to hear more variety here, especially since the ever so common sight sound properly indicates you when a new enemy has you in their sights. Without this, sometimes it can feel like an enemy popped right out of nowhere, and generally an enemy spawn with no instinctive recognition, especially in an alien horde game, is just, well, downright sacrilege. All being said, the voice samples from Duke are honestly pretty well done. <laughs> Who wants some? There's a fair number of quotes, and they can sometimes fill up the rather dry atmosphere of the game. The developers must have known that the lack of music would feel strange. This is made obvious by the very fitting sounds of whistling wind or buzzing radiators. Quite honestly, the lack of music is the elephant in the room. If it had background music, you'd probably have to prove to me that this is a Game Boy Advance game. With that being said, the amount of layers the audio can handle is already rather impressive until a sound begins looping infinitely, irritating you to no end.
Luckily this rarely ever happens, but unluckily it always required me to reboot the game to fix. In moments of heated gunfight, you can often hear upwards of five different enemies at one time. At that point you might get some blanks in your gunfire, but five enemies creating continuous audio at once is actually rather astonishing for a Game Boy Advance title. I don't find this an excuse for the lack of a soundtrack, but if anything, it does help the game feel less dry. Now that we've covered the story, graphics, audio, and technicalities of the game, we can move into talking about the gameplay. Of course, the creamy filling of any Duke Nukem donut is the gameplay, which as it should be, is the ultimate driving factor of these titles. You'd think the most well-crafted element of the game would be how it plays, and while I'll admit that they put thought into some of the areas that a lot of titles seem to forget, some very important aspects didn't seem to get as much attention as they probably should have. I want to quickly mention how irritating it is when you've run out of ammo, and you wouldn't notice until you've run up to an enemy's face and all you hear is the the same click click you hear when you pick up an item. Now, while that affects every weapon in the game, I'll admit that otherwise the weapons fit their purpose and are balanced quite well. I'd prefer using the Ripper from Duke Nukem 3D over the MP5 any day, but that's a personal preference. Anyways, to refer to that last topic, the two weapons which I did encounter some issues handling were the Shrinker and the three thrower weapons. These weapons are essentially the same as their counterparts in Duke Nukem 3D. They work mostly the same and produce the same results. It's not that which I have a problem with. The problem lies in the jerkiness of the camera, the game's flimsy collision detection, and the fact that changing weapons must be done in-game without being able to pause it. Doing this, you hold select and press L or R in the direction of stronger to weaker weapons. It's not really easy to do this and move the D-pad around at the same time. Also consider that in doing so, you wouldn't be able to strafe as you're using the L and R buttons. Running out of ammo mid-firefight is practically suicide since you've got to find another weapon that'll do the job and find it quick enough to not get violently torn apart by the onslaught of bullets and projectiles. In regards to the camera in Duke Nukem Advance, while it's not nearly as bad as some GBA shooters, it's still pretty jerky and this unfortunately makes it hard to provide accuracy in a firefight. It doesn't always get in the way, and it's possible to succeed in a battle, but don't expect to do so on the first try. Going in guns blazing only really works for a couple weapons in the game like the MP5 or sometimes the shotgun if you can get semi used to the camera to shoot in the same general direction of an enemy. Weapons like the shrinker and freeze thrower aren't always very effective as not only do they provide a threatening recoil if shot too close to a surface, but they both require a secondary method of execution. Whether you stomp on a shrunk enemy or smash it with your mighty boot, you're probably going to have a tough time reaching your target. This kind of precision would be okay if it wasn't on the Game Boy Advance. I like the added challenge, but unlike Duke 3D on the PC, you can't properly aim with a camera this jerky. Luckily, you don't have to use your mighty boot against the enemies, as once you've shrunk or froze your enemies, you can just shoot them with any other weapon to kill them in one shot. Sure, that makes these weapons pretty useful, but the recoil circumstance still gets in the way more often than it should, as all the new variants of enemies introduced in this game are projectile based. Getting in the way of those in a crunch can be borderline impossible sometimes. While there are open areas in the game with smaller hordes of enemies, there's always some sort of obstacle which force you to take caution when firing these weapons. The circumstances are way too high as a recoil shot from the freeze thrower will freeze you, leaving you helpless as you watch an enemy destroy you until you thaw, at which point you'll probably be almost dead. The two hitscan enemies in the game, the Assault Trooper and the Enforcer, are quite difficult to avoid by nature, so it would make sense that these new enemies are all projectile based. Rays are a new alien type in the Duke Nukem universe that give off nostalgic black and white horror movie vibes. They can revive enemies you've killed with the same beams that they shoot at you. It's really cool yet again to see something like this implemented on a GBA shooter and demonstrates impressive use of the game's programming. As seems to be a trend with this game though, every good thing is plagued with another bad thing. The greys in general shoot their projectiles way too quickly, which can not only cause a lot of damage but also allows them to respawn dead enemies at an alarming rate. This can be extremely troublesome when approaching a large battleground, but without a doubt this is actually very fun to deal with. The problem is sometimes it branches more into the unfair territory, because if you don't have the weapons or health to deal with the onslaught of zombified aliens, you're pretty much boned. In that sense, it's a good thing that the game isn't scarce on pickups and medkits. If you do run out, there's a good few secrets in most levels which you could try and find, sometimes being as easy as seeing a pointless vent to as random as running into a wall to have it slide open for you to reveal some goodies which could save your life. Don't expect nearly the same amount of secrets from Duke Nukem 3D, however, some levels lack in that department. On the topic of pickups, you know how in these sorts of games just before a big battle or a boss or something they'll stock you up with ammo? This game never seemed to do that, so again, you'll have to rely on what you've got at the time. This is made a lot more irritating by the fact that a checkpoint system simply does not exist. 
The game does have a battery save between levels, but playing through each level over and over when you might be close to finishing it is quite a task. Had the game not have a battery save, it'd be pretty ambitious to beat the game in just one run. I'm not sure who would want to do that as the game does get a bit repetitive after playing for a few levels, which is why I took some well-deserved breaks in between. Another thing the game does now and then to shake things up, quite literally, is enter you in destruction missions where you have to get from point A to point B quickly before the place your app blows up. This is often in relation to something Duke had done or pressed which caused a countdown to begin. These missions are pretty interesting to do, some of them have you solve puzzles in a panic which I'll admit I had a lot of fun doing, but the screen shaking was just too over the top. A lot of people criticize the game for having a rather short player field of view, and if you combine that with the rapidly spazzing out screen, you could end up with a serious headache. It's not so bad the first time, but by the time you've experienced these sorts of levels twice, you'll feel as if you've had enough of them. We've covered almost everything we need to, but the level design is still to be addressed. Large, interactive, and full of surprises, but is it good? Well, the answer to that is mostly positive. The puzzles are fun to figure out, and enemy placement is quite smart. Weapons and items show up when they're most appropriate, and the in-game ability to jump makes the locations traversable. Unfortunately, a few of the game's jumping puzzles can lead to your unfortunate doom, as being the game works on a horizontal camera, you can't see above or below you. Well, so you'd think, as the game doesn't actually inform you that when you hold down both the L and R button at the same time, and use the D-pad to look around, you can actually look up and down. Without explaining this to you, it's the same as them not even being there. You wouldn't know unless you accidentally stumbled across it. The in-game controls menu doesn't even tell you about this either, though they do allow you to change the crosshair, which is nice. What isn't nice is the obvious holes in some of the levels. An enemy shouldn't be able to recognize me in an air vent, and certainly shouldn't be able to phase into the wall randomly while still being able to shoot me, but not vice versa. Thankfully, even though these maps are quite massive in scale, the game very rarely slows down. The biggest battle in the game actually lagged less than the menu selectable map, which is pretty useless anyways. I did notice in the more expansive levels of large battles can sometimes cause projectiles to disappear in thin air, meaning you're wasting whatever you're throwing. This happens for the enemies as well, but hitscan enemies such as the Enforcer will still hurt you in these situations. In that case, it's probably a best bet to use your bullet-based weaponry when this happens, as the bullets work with direct impact, so once your bullet is shot, it's already made its mark. Now, I'm not a huge multiplayer person, but I can definitely see the appeal in the deathmatch for this game. While it has a selectable option for the game mode, you're only able to select deathmatch, so maybe co-op was once an option since removed. There's no denying that Duke Nukem Advance is pretty intense for a portable multiplayer competitive shooter on the Game Boy Advance. Classic Duke match is quite surprising with several new map layouts and new placement of weapons, as well as a new gadget coming back from older Duke titles, the Hollow Duke. I can only guess the reason this wasn't in the single player campaign is because they couldn't program the enemies to confuse between the two Dukes. This wouldn't be a problem with actual people playing the game, as that serves a part of your own logic. If there was ever a need for music though, this would be it, as when you're looking out for your opponent, empty is a key word that comes to mind. You won't feel alone, however, as the opposing player tends to respawn right behind or in front of you after death. You're able to play Duke match with up to four people if you caught the same number of carts and connection cables. I assume the poor sales of the game caused this not to really hit off. Anyways, the point I'm trying to make here is that Duke Nukem Advance is a damn fun game, it just has a lot of issues that you'll likely find infuriating, but not to the point where you gotta prematurely stop playing the game. Clearly Duke Nukem Advance had a lot of thought put into it, and it was actually delayed for being unfinished in 2001, so you know they did want to put out a quality product, even though the game didn't actually sell too well, as is with most Game Boy Advance shooters, and I guess that sort of explains itself. In a nutshell, that's essentially what Duke Nukem Advance is. It's a Game Boy Advance first person shooter, but a damn good one. I give Duke Nukem Advance a 7.5 out of 10. Who wants some?